Hi, everyone. This is Alex Epstein, host of Power Hour, with another Best of Power Hour. This week's Best of episode is Steve Malloy on the science and policy of emissions. Steve Malloy is the publisher of JunkScience.com, and he's he's a really interesting guy. I think you'll enjoy this interview. He has He's one of the few people whom you could describe as maybe more extreme than me in the sense then in the sense that he like he is very very blunt about just totally disagreeing with establishment takes on things and in this episode he's going to talk about how strongly he disagrees with the establishment take on emissions and if you if you read his Twitter profile, he always has an interesting perspective, even if I don't always agree with it. And I usually agree with it. Uh, but he's got it's it's very I find him very refreshing because he has a very stark, uh, confident perspective. He's got really strong reasons for believing what he believes. And he often makes very good points. So I've he's he's on the list of people that I follow on Twitter. And it's it's really interesting to read just his quick comments every day on the news that occasionally I'll like or retweet. So I think you will enjoy this episode and check out Junk... I believe it's JunkScience.com. Yeah, it's JunkScience.com. And you can also check him out at, at JunkScience on Twitter. So that's my intro to this show. Uh, just a reminder, if you're not on our newsletter, make sure to get there. It's AlexEpsteinList.com. That's AlexEpsteinList.com. Dot com and make sure to pre-order the new version of the Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Just go to Amazon.com and search for Moral Case for Fossil Fuels Revised. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with another Best of Power Hour. Power Hour. Coal. Oil. Natural gas. Power Hour, the show where today's top energy experts break down today's top energy issues. No sound bites, no talking points, no nonsense, no BS, no softball questions, no vagueness, just in depth analysis and ruthless clarity. Power Hour. Here's your host, Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. This week on the show, we're going to be talking about something we've actually not talked about many times, which is interesting because it's a huge issue, and that is the issue of emissions. All of those molecules that come out when we burn coal or oil or natural gas or, in a certain sense, something like radiation that that, um, emerges when you produce nuclear power, and of course, all of these things apply to producing solar and wind, to manufacturing them and whatnot. But anyway, uh, emissions are a huge issue. And in general, there's a view that our fossil fueled civilization is creating massive amounts of toxic emissions that is leading many, many people to health problems and premature deaths. Now, one of the foremost people challenging this notion and claiming that the way we think about emissions is highly unscientific is Steve Malloy, who's publisher of JunkScience.com. He's written some really interesting things on this, so I thought I'd bring him on and have him give his view on the science and policy of emissions. So we will be back with Steve on the other side. Power Hour, because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. We're joined now by Steve Malloy, publisher of JunkScience.com. Steve, welcome to Power Hour. Thanks for having me, Alex. Oh, man. Very, very eager to ask you questions today. One of the things I love about this show is that it's kind of like I get people to do my homework for me. I just, <laughs> if I have questions about something, I can just invite them on the show, and they can make my life uh, much, much easier. So as I told you before the show... Uh, the impetus for this conversation, I mean, I've followed your work for a long time, but but in particular, we had an exchange on Twitter where you made an interesting comment about uh, about smog, and, and we'll get to the specifics justifying that later, but it was, it was about how people viewed smog as a health menace, and it was really more of an aesthetic issue. That's one of taste, you know, that we, we right. don't like it for understandable reasons, but right. that it's wrong to view it as, as a health menace. So the thing I want to discuss more broadly today is, is the science 
and policy of emissions, because I think this is one of the things that is most misrepresented, this, this view that our fossil-fueled civilization is just teeming with uh, cancer-causing stuff that's making everyone's lives shorter, and if only we switch to uh, you know the unreliables like solar <laughs> and wind, life right. would be uh, much better. So I'm going to get to that. First, though, a little bit of background on you. What is JunkScience.com, and how did you get involved in this issue? Uh, well, I'm a, uh, I've got a science background uh, by training. Uh, I've got an undergraduate degree in science. I have a master's degree in biostatistics. Uh, after that, I became a lawyer and even a securities lawyer. And then around 1990, I, got, uh, I wound up working for a, a lobbyist in D.C. who worked on EPA issues uh, so I started working on risk assessment, applying my science and statistical background to that. Um, it, you know, eventually the internet happened, and I started JunkScience.com uh, in uh, April 1996. So we sort of pioneered this the whole genre of science criticism and uh, you know, criticism of activist science. And uh, you know, I, I didn't coin the phrase junk science, but I've certainly popularized it over the past almost 20 years. Well, so what is what is junk science? What does it encompass, and what and what's behind it? Well, very simply put, junk science is bad science that is used to advance an ulterior um, agenda, and that agenda can be one of uh, activist groups, or politicians, or regulators, or trial lawyers, or even businesses that want to compete unscrupulously. Anybody who knowingly uses bad science. And you know, it's not that any science is junk, any bad science is junk science. It's bad science that is so bad that the people should know that it's, it's not science, and, but they use it anyway. In the process of your research over the years, has there been anything that, that has surprised you in the sense of you, you expected that some popular opinion was basically true and then you found that it was just uh, radically false? Well, that happened right at the beginning. Um, when I came into, when I started working on environmental issues and EPA issues, I didn't know anything about the environment. I didn't know anything about EPA. I was just a statistician and a lawyer. And I got, you know, quickly thrown into a lot of issues involving pesticides, uh, nuclear power, uh, tobacco, um, air, air quality, water quality, just all sorts of issues. And, you know, I started, um, I, I remember what always really sticks out in my mind is one day I was working on a pesticide issue and EPA was claiming that this pesticide caused cancer. And so I asked the guy I worked for, I said, well, you know, how, how do they know that this causes cancer? And what I found is they really don't know. They had all these, um, you know, they, they put, they'll, they'll base these decisions based on laboratory experiments in which they basically poison laboratory animals you know, with an unbelievable amount of whatever chemical they're testing. And if they get you know, an extra case of cancer among all their rats, and all of a sudden this you know, pesticide, regardless of how useful it is, they, be, they term, determine to be carcinogenic. And so I started pursuing that angle. It's called science policy. It's sort of bridging the gap between what we know scientifically and then the implementation of that policy-wise. Um, and I did this big report for the Department of Energy in the mid-1990s called Choices of Risk Assessment. It basically described how the environmental risk assessment um, practices basically mostly policy and politics and very little science. And um, so, you know, that's, that was kind of the eye-opener for me that virtually everything I've seen um, Every environmental policy I've seen since the early 1990s has, has basically been politics, not science. And, and I mean, there are a lot of particulars to go through. I, you know, it's a very broad brush I'm painting with, um, but it, it really is true. I mean, you can name the topic, we can talk about it, and I can explain to you all the politics in it and the lack of science. Well, since we're talking about emissions, maybe, maybe we can start by yeah, talking that's, about... That's, good. that's a good place to start. Yeah, let's talk about what what a proper scientific uh, approach would be. Because obviously, you mentioned that uh, you know with the laboratory animals that they're being poisoned in the sense of you know poison as a matter of dosage, which is one of the principles that that people don't apply in this context. But so it's certainly true that you know the, the combustion of fossil fuels, like many other 
uh, processes can lead to unhealthy concentrations of things. You know, this is why people uh, kill themselves using carbon monoxide in their garage. <laughs> no, but, but so it's... Okay, it, that's true, but... It's a legitimate... No, no, but it's a... All I'm saying is it's a legitimate area of inquiry to look at what concentrations of certain kinds of materials could be uh, unhealthy for people. So I guess I'm asking, what what are some of the guidelines that we should use when exploring this positively? Because later well, we're going to get into I, I would, policy. I would just, I would look at it this way. You know, the air, it, when I was growing up in the 1960s, um, the air was dirty, especially, you know, Los Angeles is the classic example of all this a smog laden city. Okay. Now, you know, despite as, as badly as Los Angeles was polluted, no one really noticed that there were any public health consequences to that. I mean, it was unpleasant. Maybe people's eyes would water. You know, you, the sky was all sorts of colors. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, nothing that anybody wanted. But, you know, there was no epidemic of, of deaths from air pollution, no epidemic of cancer, no epidemic of asthma, none of that stuff. Nevertheless, you know, starting in 1963, the Clean, Federal Clean Air Act was passed, was amended in 1970, 1977. We just sort of decided, okay, we're going we're gonna to limit emissions and clean up the air. So we, and by 1990, we had largely done that. And so we get into the mid-1990s, and although the air is, is clean, certainly clean enough that no one is experiencing any health effects, um, nevertheless, EPA wants to ratchet down uh, the air, air pollution standard, air, air quality standards make them more stringent. And so one of the things they did was sort of create this emission uh, or uh, air quality um, pollutant called PM 2.5, which is very small particulate matter, about two and a half millionths uh, of, a, of a meter in diameter. It's very small. It's, it's much smaller than the uh, thickness of a human hair. And you know, EPA's main argument over the past 20 years is that PM 2.5 in the air, which comes out of automobile tailpipes and uh, coal-fired power plant smokestacks, that any exposure, any inhalation of PM 2.5 is killing people. And in fact, the EPA administrator testified in Congress in 2011 that uh, just about one quarter of all U.S. deaths every year are due to PM 2.5. What? <laughs> it's true. Are and due to or influenced by? No, caused. Caused. And, you know, since Obama has been in office and since his 2009-2010 bid to uh, implement cap and trade fail, you know, he has turned to EPA to, uh, you know, conduct his war on coal. And... Every regulation he has issued, including the cross-state air pollution rule and the mercury air transport standard, and even his most recent global warming rules, they all hinge entirely, or you know, the, the, the alleged benefits from these rules hinge entirely on this notion that this fine particulate matter in the air, PM 2.5, kills people and kills hundreds of thousands of us every year. So every time, you know, EPA takes or you know, think, claims to take PM 2.5 out of the air, they're saving lives. So um, in EPA CO2 rules, they claim they're saving, I think, about 6,600 lives per year. In the other two rules, I mentioned the cross-state and mercury air transport standard, the total went up to EPA saving 38,000 lives per year. And of course, this is all nonsense. Because EPA is not saving any lives because PM 2.5 doesn't kill anybody. Well, to many people, that'll be that's a jarring statement, right? Because we just kind of there's I think there's just this mental model of the, basically right. like the coal stacks so, are the equivalent of, of cigarettes that are just. So I, I, I will I will rant on that. Um, so I started working on this issue in 1996 when EPA first proposed to regulate PM 2.5. At the time, EPA was claiming that you know implementing. You know, uh, implementing EPA's regulation would save 15,000 lives per year. So, you know, I'm a statistician. I'm a biostatistician, actually. I'm you know, very familiar with epidemiology. So I looked at the um, studies of human populations EPA was relying on. And, you know, they were very, very poorly done studies, very weak studies. Uh, they're, you know, epidemiology is just statistics. And you know what they say about statistics. So, um, 
you know, I, I pointed this out to people, and, and we got Congress to ask EPA, show us, you know, the, the raw data from your epidemiology studies. Give us the data, let us analyze it, then we can compare and contrast and haggle it out. Well, of course, EPA wouldn't do that. EPA wouldn't provide the raw data. Why not? And it actually stiff-armed Congress. It was really incredible. It was the first time um, I'd ever seen that. And so EPA has gotten away with this for the last, oh, uh, 15 or 16 years, and Congress has recently picked up this, I call it secret science, EPA secret science. Um, to this day, EPA is still withholding this data and refuses to turn it over to Congress, even though EPA has been subpoenaed by the House of Representatives, even though the House has passed a bill called the Secret Science Reform Act, which require that you know all EPA regulate the raw data for all EPA regulations be made available to the public. Um, so EPA has always been hiding its its data and its science. Um, and you know, around 2011, um, you know, I I, I got a, I kind of got fed up with this, and um, you know, it's very difficult to attack EPA science because they wouldn't share it. And, you know, if you criticize EPA with technical, statistical, epidemiological uh, terms, concepts, and jargon, you know, EPA just answers you back with mumbo-jumbo and everybody's confused. So, so I started taking this tack and I started it in a, uh, I think it was, it was a Washington Times column from June 2000, July 2011. I said, EPA, show us the bodies. If so many people are dying every year, who are these people? Where are they? Let's, you know, let's have a medical investigation of someone you say died from PM 2.5. Let's see if that's really true. So after I wrote that column, <clears throat> you know, I was attacked by environmentalists. Uh, I was even attacked in Congress. Um, I survived all that stuff because EPA could not produce a body and neither could any environmentalist or any Democrat congressman. They just couldn't do it. And so then, you know, I, I was really sort of, I, I, I decided to get more and more deeper and deeper into this issue. And that led me to all sorts of revelations about EPA's PM 2.5 science. Um, I discovered that EPA was, had been conducting human testing with PM 2.5. Uh, and the point of that testing was to show that, you know, EPA, had, EPA says it has hundreds of epidemiologic studies showing that PM 2.5 kills, but of course all those studies are just statistics. There's nothing scientific about any of them. They don't have it. None of those studies has any medical evidence that 2.5 is killing anybody. So what EPA was doing was sort of you know, almost covertly conducting human experiments with PM 2.5, trying to make something bad happen, and they would expose people to huge amounts of PM 2.5. You know, the the average amount of PM 2.5 in the atmosphere is about 10 millionths of a gram. Um, EPA was uh, testing 600 millionths of a gram on these, you know, human guinea pigs. And, of course, nothing was happening because PM 2.5 doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a big to-do about that. And we had the EPA Inspector General review EPA. So, I mean, that's a whole saga you can read about on junk science. But the, the bottom line for us is that when EPA tried to add medical meat on its statistical bones – it couldn't do anything. There, there's, there's, just, there's just nothing, there's no science, no biology, no medicine, um, no evidence whatsoever that supports EPA's statistical claims that PM 2.5 kills. So as a, as a contrast, what would a legitimate, uh, like is there some substance that, that you can show this for legitimately that there's you know a real health problem with or that there was and, and we can just see in contrast what a legitimate methodology well, would look like? Well, you know, it's hard it, it you know it's hard to it would be hard to test with humans uh, looking for death. I mean that would be that would be unethical. EPA does it anyway. <laughs> I mean you really you really ought not be doing that. But an area where that we could test that wouldn't necessarily put anybody in danger, you know, EPA also says that ozone or, um, you know, ozone smog and PM2.5 PM both, uh, EPA claims that they also cause asthma or trigger asthma. Okay. Now that is something you can test because you could put asthmatics in a laboratory um, and expose them, make them inhale high levels of ozone and PM 2.5 and see whether, you know, asthma is triggered. 
And in fact, EPA has done that. And you know what? They can't even trigger asthma in asthmatics, even if they amp up the ozone way, way, way past you know, what they're proposing to lower it to now, or ambient PM2.5 levels. I mean, the EPA in a laboratory can't trigger asthma. Is, where, so, where can we find that? I mean, that that is a smoking well, I have gun. stuff on junk science. I mean, I'm just waiting for somebody to be interested in it. <laughs> you, know, you know, you can't, um, you know, I know people on Capitol Hill are interested in it, but um, you don't get much interest from industry because industry is af afraid of ruffling EPA's feathers. And, of course, I mean, this goes to the core of... Um, you know, the scientific fraud at EPA. I'm working on a whole book right now <laughs> about this. And, you know, one day it's going to make a great, uh, uh, you know, lawsuit <laughs> against the EPA. I just need a whistleblower, you know, to provide me the smoking gun because it's, it's also obvious what EPA is doing. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, because the area is very complex, I mean, I, I feel like I'm making a mash of what I'm describing to you just because there's so many parts to this story and it's hard to condense in, you know, just a, a few sentences. Right. So part of what I think is helpful is, is so I like the example of, um, you know, when possible and ethical, can you show in a laboratory that X amount, yeah. I mean, certainly if you could, if you could isolate it um, in a laboratory that, you know, that, that the amount of stuff that was in the air was actually helpful. And then you put them in a clean room or something and they breathe perfectly. You know, yeah. that would be a great kind of thing. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, what about, though, you mentioned how these all these, quote, studies are manipulations of statistics. But what about things where you can show a very, very strong statistical correlation over many populations? Is that in, in I'm not saying they're doing it in any of these cases, but but. Isn't that a legitimate methodology, at least to, to posit some well, cause and effect? Well, you know, it, it's like anything else. You know, uh, you have to use the right tool for the right set of circumstances. Now, um, you know, using a screwdriver to drive a nail is not very smart. Using uh, epidemiology also has its limitations. You know, epidemiology, classic epidemiology is great for the example of, say, food poisoning. Okay, it's a, it's a, the, um, you know, uh, Epidemiologists will interview people who got sick. They'll ask them where they ate. They'll trace the food back, you know, to something the day before. It's all, you know, you'll get this huge statistical correlation. You know, the people who got sick in this area ate at this restaurant. Okay, case closed. That's very, you know, and then <clears throat> public health people can go to the restaurant, sample the food, and they'll, you know, close close the deal. Epidemiology, especially when applied to PM, is completely different because. You know, EPA's main, main endpoint is death, and EPA claims that par particulate matter hastens death. Well, you know, number one, everybody dies. Half the people die before life expectancy. Um, you know, there's, we don't know what a PM 2.5 death looks like. No one's ever been determined to have died from PM 2.5. So you have that whole problem of identifying deaths. On the exposure side, um, you know, with, with the food poisoning, we know the people ate at the restaurant, or at least have a pretty good inkling they ate at the restaurant. With PM 2.5, we have no idea what anybody, how much PM 2.5 people inhaled. Um, EPA often relies on, you know, air monitors closest to where people live. But of course, those air monitors might have nothing to do with how much PM 2.5 um, they're exposed to. You know, people have, people, uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time inside. PM 2.5 level is completely different than outside. Uh, people's houses are varying levels of dust. They have, they have pets, pet dander. You can live in an area with pollen. Um, one, you know, there are occupational exposures. People who uh, work with engines, engine exhaust, wood dust, um, and probably the biggest one is just smoking. You know, P PM two smoke smoke from a cigarette is basically PM two point five. All right. And, you know, outside, EPA, outside the average U.S. air, it's probably a little higher in Los Angeles, but average U.S. air is about 10 millionths of a gram of PM2.5 in, in a cubic meter of air. And so over the course of a day, someone might inhale maybe 200 millionths of a gram. Well, if you smoke a cigarette, you'll inhale about 40,000 millionths of a gram in about five minutes. Wow. And has any, you know... 
I, I defy anyone <laughs> to show me someone who has just keeled over from smoking a cigarette. It doesn't happen. Now, the question for EPA is, well, if I can smoke a cigarette and inhale 40,000 millionths of a gram of PM2.5 in five minutes and not die, how am I to believe that normal U.S. air is killing 25% of, of Americans? I mean, you asked for a scientific, um, uh, you know, what kind of scientific study could be done? Well, we've, we've actually already done them. I mean, if you smoke a cigarette and live to tell about it the next day, you've already debunked the EPA. And there's a million other examples that I could go into. I mean, this is, it's, PM2.5 is a very common exposure. People, are, people can get a lot of it, and nothing happens, and we know this. But EPA, EPA has created this whole regulatory program based on this bogus notion that PM2.5 kills. Well, so then what, what should be policy? Like, what, what should be, I mean, you know, how, how should these things, uh, you know, how should these things be decided? Because people think of, well, certainly, at least in the case of a place like China, you know, there's something there. It would be a lot nicer yeah. if there weren't all this smog there. Well, right sure. Now. But, you, you know, that's a completely different circumstance in the United States. Um, for, you know, for, for the United States, how, however the air was, however bad the air was in 1970, Guess what? It's no longer 1970. It's 2015, 45 years later. Um, our air is about as pristine as it's going to get, especially with the sort of economy we have. But our, I mean, our, our air is completely safe. It's completely clean. Um, the problem, though, is that the air, the EPA, is operating under you know an outmoded law, a law that assumes that the air is going to be continually dirty, that EPA would have to continually monitor the air, and that's just not how it is. Anymore. Okay, so our air is clean. We, we actually need to um, roll back the EPA on this because the, the Obama EPA is showing uh, what happens with an, an agency that, that uh, is compelled to continually tighten air quality standards. There's no benefit, just huge costs. And that's all we're experiencing now from the EPA. In China, I mean, you know, China's problem is that it's still a relatively poor society. They, you know, they need to industrialize, and uh, you know, there's, there. I'm, I'm not saying that I'd want to live there. I wouldn't, um, but you know, there, there is going to be some pollution pain they pay to get their economy up to speed. And it's going to take them a long time to clean their air. Um, you know, you, you can't just go uh, from no economy to an industrial economy and not expect to experience some pollution. Now. You know, I mean, I, I feel for the I feel for the Chinese. I mean, that, that is terrible air to breathe. But there's no quick solution. I mean, if they you know if they want to develop their economy, you know, they have become the world's uh, manufacturing center. And as long as that's the case, um, you know, until they spend the money to clean up their factories, which is going to take a long time, um, you know, they're going to have this problem. You know, a lot of the air problem in China is actually caused by you know, most people, they like to blame it on coal. Well, if you look at studies, it's, it's really mostly the traffic in China and uncontrol uncontrolled um, manufacturing emissions. It's really not the Chinese power plants. Um, but sometimes even the Chinese government blames the power plants. You know, I think they've uh, decided to shut down some coal-fired power plants in, in Beijing. But the real problem is not, you know, the coal-fired power plants. The problem is you know, a lot of the Chinese people are not really on the electricity grid yet. So, you know, they cook and heat their homes with coal briquettes. Okay, just like if you can imagine, you know, there are a lot of apartment buildings in the early, mid-20th century were heated with coal. You know, you just shove the coal into the furnace and, you know, <laughs> the soot goes out the uh, chimney and into the atmosphere. Well, that's what's going on in China. With a, at a lot of you know uh, apartments and, and uh, residences and businesses, that's just how they live right now. And until they change that, you know their air is going to be as bad as it was, um, you know, in London for the hundred years between 1850 and 1950. I want to go through. You mentioned that there's lots of these emissions examples. I want to. I'll pick a couple and then uh, if if I leave any out, let me know. But I want to just do myth reality 
uh, on a couple of these. So what about uh, mercury, which is particularly tied to coal? You know, where everyone's getting yeah. poisoned via yeah. mercury from coal. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, U.S. power plant emissions are about a half percent of you know mercury emissions to the atmosphere every year. Um, you know, Mother Nature is responsible for about 70%. There's a lot of ocean outgassing. Mercury comes from ocean outgassing and just outgassing from the crust. Um, you know, mercury is definitely a toxin, but it, you know, it depends on the dose. You know, we know that from uh, experiences in Japan in the 1950s <clears throat> and Iraq in 1970, that very high exposures, like you're eating mercury-laden food, like fish, or in the case of Iraq, it was grain. Um, if you eat a lot of that, yeah, you're gonna, there's going to be some uh, some adverse effects. But you know, this, the sort of mercury that is in our ambient environment right now that we find in fish, none of that is harmful, and there's never been any study that shows that it is harmful. So, how did they get away with? saying that it's harmful because they'll say, oh, it's been proven in hundreds of studies that it's harmful. Well, they get away with it because first off, you know, EPA has a whole stable of scientists that it pays and it pays, um, it pays them to get the answers it wants. And not only does EPA pay the scientists to do the research, then EPA pays the very same scientists to review their own work. It's a closed system. It's corrupt. There's, there's no chance to really criticize EPA's science. Um, <clears throat> now the real, you know, the next problem is you can't challenge EPA science because you can't get into court. There's no way um, that there's, you know, the environmental laws are written by environmentalists to be enforced by environmentalists. They were not written by guys in industry who feel they've been aggrieved. So it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to challenge EPA science. As a matter of fact, um, with the Clean Air Act, until, oh, until the 1990 amendments, you used to be, I mean, there, were, there was an ability to challenge EPA on science for a lot of air quality regulations, air toxics regulations. As a matter of fact, uh, people would challenge EPA and, and block EPA from doing anything because EPA was just always using junk science and always crazy. Well, the 1990 amendments ended that. So there's no more challenging EPA on science. It's just based on, on uh, technology. You know, EPA can mandate that you use whatever technology you can afford uh, to reduce emissions. Um, but, you know, but the biggest problem is that, that you can't challenge EPA in court anymore. Uh, so, so EPA can just run roughshod. And I mean, there's Supreme Court rulings that, that allow agencies def, uh, a lot of deference in interpreting um, their, their statutes. And you know, the Supreme Court, even with Scalia and, and those guys, I mean, they have not yet figured out how EPA has corrupted science. Uh, what about the, the methane uh, emissions standards are a, a big discussion point right now. Um, any yeah, so EPA, yeah, EPA wants to crack down on uh, uh, methane emission, methane leaks, basically. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't, you know, first off, everybody in the oil and gas industry, they're already incentivized to reduce leaks. Okay, they're already incentivized to do that. Um, so, you know, saying that, oh, they're going to make a lot more money by, uh, you know, fixing the leaks, so that's just not true. The, the bigger issue, though, is that it's, it's not at all clear, and it doesn't seem to be any evidence that methane is really driving global climate in any particular direction. Um, you know, it's just, um, you know, there, there's a physical reason for it. I mean, methane is, it is part of the uh, uh, spectrum that, absorbs heat where there's a lot of other competitors for that same heat and it's already been absorbed by water, water vapor or CO2. So there's, you know, methane, methane is, could be a big nothing burger uh, as far as greenhouse gas and global warming. That's an interesting point. Can, can you elaborate on that? The, the idea of, of different infrared absorbers, I think is the category, uh, competing uh, for heat? Because I think people think of it as, well, there's an infinite capacity for these materials or for these yeah, substances no, to work. You've got this on junk science as well. I mean, um, you know, there's only so much heat that comes uh, off the earth and it comes in a, you know, in a spectrum. And if, uh, you know, that spectrum is, um, you know, filled up by some other, um, you know, competitor greenhouse gas like water vapor or carbon dioxide, well then there's no, 
there's no uh, infrared radiation left over for methane to absorb. Um, you know, uh, and, and so, and this is true also true for carbon dioxide. You know, at some point, adding carbon dioxide into the system doesn't make any difference because, well, all the infrared has been absorbed already. So it does, it's, not, it's not true that just adding carbon dioxide in the system is going to make uh, the planet, you know, hotter and hotter and hotter until we're just boiling to death. Uh, that's, that's just not how it works. Well, people would say, people would often say, well, what about Venus? Isn't that a case where you have like 99% <laughs> well, CO2? <laughs> yeah. Okay, our atmosphere is, you know, uh, 400 parts per million CO2. Venus is 97%. See, it's, com it's a completely different plant and atmosphere. <laughs> and we're not going to be there any anytime soon. I mean, we'll never get there. I mean, there's, you could burn all the fossil fuels we have, not going to get there. Not even going to get close. Um, okay, what are, what are the other uh, emissions issues that you think are important and misrepresented right now? Well, I mean, right now, the, you know, the, the big regulation hanging over American industry is this ozone rule, which uh, you know, the manufacturing industry says it's going to be the most extensive EPA regulation of all time. You know, killing millions of jobs, entailing maybe a trillion dollars worth of regulatory costs. And, um, you know, I, I look at those and regulation, I go, well, what are the health benefits? And, you know, EPA says, well, it's going to, re you know, prevent hundreds of thousands of cases of asthma. And once again, it's going to prevent, you know, thousands of deaths. And I say, you know, the science we have shows that none of that is true. Um, we're going we're gonna to crack down on industry. We're going to have more pristine air than we already have. Um, but it's not going to have any health impact at all. And we're going to have much less of the economy. With those ozone regulations, elaborate a little bit on, on how damaging they are, why it is they're so expensive. Well... <clears throat> You know, I actually think that the compliance costs are not the worst part of the ozone. You know, the compliance costs are, uh, you know, reducing your emissions to satisfy EPA permits or state permits and, and uh, make sure that, you know, these wherever, uh, whatever locality you're in that, you know, uh, the ozone level, you know, stays below the EPA standard. Um, you know, I, I do think that's expensive and that, you know, maybe industry is right. That that's going to be a trillion dollars worth of costs over a number of years. But I think the, the more serious cost is the opportunity cost because <clears throat> what it means is if you're a state operating, uh, you know, if your ozone level is um, near the EPA limit, well, you know, you're, you're going to think twice about you know, having a new industrial facility that might raise your ozone level and cause all sorts of political problems for you. So there's a lot of businesses, you know, people want to bring manufacturing back from China. Well, it's going to be tough to do with EPA rules as they are uh, because it's going to push areas over their ozone limits. And, and politicians are not going to want to do that because environmentalists will make them pay a price. They'll, they'll, they'll trash them unbelievably. Um, even though these emissions will have no public health effect. Aren't there places that naturally have higher amounts of ozone than what the EPA says is oh, sure. toxic? And, and, yeah, and, and EPA is ratcheting down uh, the ozone standard to the point where in some areas, you know, because of the vegetation, um, you, you know, with the vegetation, they're going to just naturally exceed EPA levels. Uh, it, it's all really kind of crazy. I mean... You know, EPA has decided that there is no safe level of PM2.5 in the atmosphere, and they have decided that there is no safe level of ozone in the atmosphere. And, um, you know, so as far as EPA is concerned, they're just going to ratchet these standards down, make it more difficult for American business. And what, what EPA gets out of this is that EPA gets control over the economy because EPA gets to decide... Uh, which industries survive? You know, EPA gets to write all the permits and EPA approves all the state permits. And so it becomes this exercise of you know, arbitrary power. EPA, you know, uh, we see it, it's, it's crony capitalism. Uh, 
the friends of President Obama are doing really well in solar and wind industry. <laughs> so the, all the entire American economy is just going to become crony capitalism. Well, I'm really interested to see – when's your book coming out, by the way? Well, I'm just finishing it up now, so I hope sometime in the fall. We'll see. Oh, wow. Well, that's a quick – Yeah, see, it's, it's really it's sort of you know, my, my personal journey through this air quality. And it's really – I mean, I, you know, I've interacted with just about everybody there is to interact with on this issue one way or another. And so it's, it's sort of my personal journey, and I go through the science and all the reality examples that contradict EPA. It's really going to be a, it's, it's going to be a unique piece of work. Uh, great. Well, we'll try to get you on when, uh, when you have that, and it'll be really interesting to ask about uh, the motives of the EPA. Uh, with the time remaining, though, I want to I ask about policy and what you think should be done. So, I mean, in no particular order, what are what are your if if you you know if you were the uh, next president, what what would you what would be your four point or five point or ten point plan for liberating us of this pseudoscience menace? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah. The first thing I would do is I would I would roll back the EPA's responsibilities. <clears throat> um, you know. EPA has sort of admitted this already to Congress, but about 85% of environmental protection is already done by the states. And I, I, would, I would increase that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, environment is best, uh, is a local issue, best controlled. Now, there are some issues that cross boundaries and cross nations, and, you know, possibly there's some EPA involvement there. Um, but, you know, I would definitely scale back. I would not put EPA on, EPA on its treadmill where it has to review its air quality regulations in the U.S. every five years. I think that's just silly. <clears throat> I would, I would um, take away uh, the opportunity for environmentalists to just sue and settle with EPA. You know, EPA issued these global warming uh, uh, rules based on uh, you know, the sue, uh, sue and settle scheme of the environmentalists. You know, the environmentalists sued EPA demanding that they regulate global war, uh, CO2 emissions and to settle the lawsuit, the EPA agreed to do it. Like, it's, it's totally bogus. I would eliminate that. Um, I would force, I would make EPA science uh, judicially reviewable. If uh, EPA uses science, you ought to be able to go to court and demand a fair review of that. I would make sure that EPA, all the data, all the data from every study EPA relies on, all that data must be publicly available so that people can challenge it. Um, I would ease access to the courts. Uh, you know, I mean, famously, only environmentalists can get into court with EPA. I mean, they can they, they can file a federal suit as, as you know fast as anything and force EPA to do something on a on a, um, on, a, on, a on a time schedule that is has been dictated by the Clean Air Act. Uh, if you're an aggrieved party in industry, you know, you can't get into court. I mean, you look at just recently the coal industry sued EPA on its global warming rules. They sued before the EPA rules were final because what's the point in waiting? First off, they, were, they had a legal challenge as to whether EPA could even propose the rules to start with. And, I mean, the court really should have addressed that issue, but of course they didn't. Um, and so now, you know, you know, the damage has already been done from these EPA rules and, you know, now it's going to take years for the industry lawsuits to work their way up to the Supreme Court and get a decision. Um, you know, EPA has just too much power to destroy too much, um, too much wealth and too many people's lives uh, without being held accountable at all. What about, so you mentioned that the science should be judicially reviewable and that the data is publicly available. I mean, that is a crime that government data of that yeah. kind is not available. Sure. Uh, I mean, we see this with the climate catastrophists as well, that they like non-existent, they like inaccessible data. Uh, what about though, what should the, insofar as EPA or some comparable set of laws, what, what should their positive principles be in terms of how they conduct science? Positive principles? Yeah, like they have to, I mean, they have to tell people, hey, this is how we do science. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you know, well, the irony here is that EPA does have guidelines for how it's supposed to conduct science. The problem is, number one, 
they're written a, in a very loosey goosey way, uh, so that you know, I mean, they're so, they're so squishy, EPA can dance around them anytime. But but probably the bigger issue is that they're not enforceable by anybody. Um, it's like it's like a lot of laws we're subject to. Um, they're not enforceable <laughs> by by anybody. You know, the law says EPA must do this. You know, A, B, and C. But nobody can nobody can enforce it. For example, you know, when EPA was doing those human tests human tests, um, we sued them because those tests were illegal. First off, they are fundamentally illegal because, um, you know, you can't, you can't ask study subjects to risk their lives in a human experiment. Number two, um, even if you could do that, you would have to tell them that they were risking their lives in, 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 a, in, in a consent document, informed consent. And EPA wasn't doing that. EPA never mentioned, you know, EPA tells everybody else PM 2.5 kills. But in these human tests, they weren't telling their human guinea pigs that they thought PM 2.5 killed. So, so we sued EPA on that and because they were conducting um, a new human experiment. We said, Your Honor, uh, you know, this is illegal. Uh, EPA, you know, these experiments are illegal and EPA is not telling these people that they're risking their lives, according to EPA anyway. And he said, well, he threw us out of court and said, look, you guys don't have standing. I mean, the people that sh the only people that can sue EPA would be, you know, the human guinea pigs themselves. Of course, they don't know any of this. They don't know. They don't know to sue because they're not being told that EPA is risking their life, their lives. So the whole thing was kind of crazy. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> EPA was breaking the law, but we, you know, a third party couldn't enforce it. So you mentioned that that they have, you know, squishy rules that are hard to hold anyone to but i'm just i'm trying to get to i mean the reason i asked this what if president malloy had control is because i think we need to have be clear about where we stand in terms of what the epa or you know what what more broadly government should be doing scientifically with regard to studying these emissions questions and then uh, yeah. presenting them to well, the public okay I, well so what what i think the government should be doing I mean, number one we should take the government out of science the government has no business in science. Uh, it, it government only corrupts science. Government pays for the science it wants. That science is corrupted. And if you can't challenge it because EPA is hiding the data, then the whole, the whole system is just is, 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 is corrupt. So I would take EPA out. I, as a matter of fact, I would make sure that whatever regulator we have, they can't pay for their own science. Um, you know, somebody else needs to do the science and then you know, EPA can look at it and propose a solution, and then, you know, that solution needs to be openly debated. And it can't just be imposed on people uh, willy-nilly. And we, we don't have anything like that right now. I mean, it, you know, it would probably be several more radio programs <laughs> where we could figure out exactly what that system would be. But the system we have right now where EPA pays for the science it wants, hides the data from everybody else, and it's not reviewable, that is a broken system. Okay, so if, if the government is, I mean, out of science, which I, I believe on principle it should be, what about, I mean, let's say there's some concern about, uh, you know, you want to know what happens with mercury emissions and then there's not a good, there aren't good studies available. What would be the recourse? I mean, wouldn't the government have to Well, I mean, something? you know, look, right now, you know, we have lots of, we've had lots of experience with emissions. Um, you know, people have lived through all sorts of air quality, and I can't emphasize this enough. Um, you know, people people ignore the whole scientific body available on tobacco use. I mean, there's nothing, um, there's no air pollution in the world that comes anywhere close to smoking a cigarette. Okay, even in China. If you breathe the worst air all day, that's equivalent to about one or two cigarettes. Okay, <clears throat> so you know we we know a lot of the effects of you know inhalation toxicology. We know what inhalation toxicology is. We know what the risks are from you know uh, from smoking. And but what we don't want to do is apply that. And, and we need to apply the knowledge we already have. This. We don't need to create things just out of whole cloth or conduct new research programs. There, there aren't new substances that are being emitted. You know, it's the same old substances we've always emitted. Um, we know what the toxicology is. The problem is we've let EPA run wild saying crazy things 
and nobody nobody wants to defend themselves uh, against the EPA. I mean, the coal industry has shockingly been put almost out of business by EPA. Has the coal industry ever tried to defend itself on PM 2.5 or ozone? No. Yeah, that and that is. A I whole mean, it's way, it's yeah. it's it, you know, I was in the coal industry. It's inexplicable. <laughs> okay, you. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. I, you know, I was I was flabbergasted. Okay, I mean, this was obvious fraud, scientific fraud on the part of EPA. Obvious. People in Congress get it, but you can't get you know the echo from industry. They're just, you know, they're afraid of EPA. EPA. You know, EPA is one of these organizations where, you know, even if you defeat EPA on one issue, they're going to come back and get you on the other. It's always been like that. Uh, that is one of the, you know, that's one reason why you can't get big companies to complain about EPA because they have so many issues before the agency. Uh, they're literally at the agency's mercy. You'll, you'll win here today. They're going to win someplace else tomorrow, and it's going to be worse. Yeah, that's definitely something that, yeah, it is, it's changed. Yeah, it's gangster government, really. It's always been like that. As long as I've been, I've been in this business for more than twenty-five years, um, it's always been that way. Just very quickly, with the the, I, I think it's a really important point about how we have all of this existing knowledge that is not being applied, or, or possibly it's being misapplied. Um, what do we know about tobacco toxicology in terms of, say, I mean, do, do they know, say? What happens to somebody who smokes one cigarette a day? Well, well, the answer is nothing. <laughs> okay, um, you know, let's let's look at PM two point five because that's <clears throat> really the best example. Um, EPA regulates on the basis that there is no safe exposure to PM two point five. That means the only safe exposure to PM two point five is zero. Okay, even on a blue sky day, I live in, in uh, right outside of Washington D.C. A blue sky day there's still 10 micrograms of PM 2.5 in every cubic meter of air, okay? And I'm going to breathe, I don't know, 200 of those on a daily basis. Um, EPA says that is unsafe, okay? Meanwhile, we know someone who smokes a cigarette is going to get 40,000 millions of a gram in about five minutes. I mean, it's an incredible dose. If PM 2.5 killed, then anybody who smoked a cigarette would be dead but before the next day. Okay, that's the kind of toxicology I'm talking about. And we know that doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, even if, if, if you've had a heart attack, <laughs> you can smoke a cigarette and not be dead the next day. Um, I just I went to my doctor's office the other day, and he was telling me about, you know, he takes, he's a thoracic surgeon, he takes people's lungs out because they're smokers. And one of the big problems he has is even, even after he takes their lung out or a piece of their lung, they, they don't stop smoking. I mean, they live. <laughs> and so... You know, what all this shows is this, this notion that there's no such thing as a safe level of, of PM2.5 exposure. That's just false. Everybody knows it. <clears throat> you know, we have coal miners have worked underground. They work an entire career underground in incredibly dusty conditions. Incredibly dusty. Do they just keel over and die from PM2.5? No. No, they don't. Uh, as a matter of fact, coal miners on average live longer than the average member of the population, even though their PM 2.5 ex exposure is orders and orders and orders of magnitude higher. I've never heard that stat. That's really yeah. interesting. If you look at, um, if you compare Washington, D.C. to Beijing, okay, Beijing has 10 times the PM 2.5 of Washington, D.C., okay, 10 times. The average life expectancy in Beijing is three years longer than Washington, D.C. Okay, really? so, yeah. So, so we, we know. Is this all on JunkScience.com? We got a lot of stuff to... It's, yeah, I got a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's certainly going to be in my book. So we have a lot of evidence that on a short-term basis and a long-term basis, PM2.5 doesn't kill anybody. And, you know, how important is PM2.5? It's really the only thing to talk about. <clears throat> EPA has, they have a report, and EPA Chief Gina McCarthy has testified in Congress numerous times and made public statements that by 2020, EPA expects that its 
its air pollution regulations, air quality regulations, are going to provide two trillion dollars worth of benefits per year. Okay, two trillion. Eighty-five percent of that number comes from saving lives from reducing PM two point five, according to EPA. That's how important PM two point five is to the environmental debate. And I would suggest to you that if I can falsify the notion that eighty-five percent of EPA's benefits come from from uh, 2.5. If I can falsify that, I would suggest that the other 15% of EPA's benefits are equally suspicious. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. an issue we're not hearing enough about, and that's part of the reason I wanted to uh, to bring you on. So, as we wrap up, um, obviously you've mentioned JunkScience.com. I assume that's the primary place where people can learn about you. Uh, any any suggestions for readers on on how to navigate that or how to find all these different things? We'll hunt down as many as, as we can when we edit well, the show. Well, yeah. So if you're interested in the, um, uh, first off, I have a uh, a fact sheet on junk science about all this PM two point five stuff, which uh, I will I will feature right after uh, I get off the phone with you. I will put it at the top of junk science so people can uh, locate it easily. Uh, it'll be right at the top. And, um, but if you, you know, go down on the, if you scroll down the left side, look at my categories, if you, it's the human testing that really spends the most time with PM 2.5. So I've spent, a, you know, a number of years, we've, we've sued EPA. I have, I have battled innumerable environmentalists and Congress people and all sorts of, and scientists about, I mean, that's where all this stuff is. It's in the human, human studies category of junk science, but I will, I will uh, post the fact sheet so people can uh, can see it. And, um, you know, I tweet about this stuff all the time. And that is at Junk Science? At Junk Science. At Junk Science. Uh, well, Steve, thanks a lot. I learned a lot. I'm sure the listeners did as well. Yeah, I'm sure it's been an earful. <laughs> it's, hard, you know, it's hard to do in a short conversation. Um, but... Uh, you know, I'm happy to come back anytime. Yeah, well, we'll we'll, we'll promote the book uh, once it comes out, and and uh, look forward to, uh, look forward to convincing somebody to give me an advanced copy. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks again to Steve Malloy for coming on the program. One thing that I pushed for in this interview, and that I think is is important, and and Steve indicated is still something that needs to be developed more is what is the what is the positive policy toward this you know what are the protocols that a government and and whether it's a court system dealing with cases or some sort of uh, branch of the executive how should it be conducting science what are the parameters and i think it's it's important to get clear on this so i'm going to be thinking about this a lot i have been thinking about it working with people like steph and han at cip and others to try to formulate some some good guidelines. So these are going to appear in one form or another in the Energy Liberation Plan, uh, which I mentioned last week. And just that that should just be another reason to check it out. So go to energyliberationplan.com to sign up to get the full plan on October 5th. Uh, we'll also have the uh, also go to the Forbes article if you just search Forbes Energy Liberation Plan, that'll come up. Share that with your friends and uh, I think I think it, it's going to fill a gap that's needed for for a truly positive plan that can show people, hey, here's how we can create a world of of energy abundance that'll improve life across the board. That's all for this time. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at industrialprogress dot net. Uh, make sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter whether it's the Alex Epstein account, the Industrial Progress account, or Center for Industrial Progress account, I Love Fossil Fuels, or I Love Nuclear. All right, next week we will be back with another great guest, another great show. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.